thank you. And uh, I'd like to say that that Meredith is a is a long long time collaborator of mine. And I'd I'd also like to say that it's a it's a great service that she and her uh, co-organizers are are doing to the for the biophysics community by by running this. So thanks, thank you all. So as you can tell from my my title, I'm going to be talking about fluid dynamics of of cells. And uh, I've had a, a, a list of really uh, fine and fun collaborators, and uh, I think most of them are, are sitting here, and you can see that. So uh, let me start uh, by giving you some examples of observed flows inside of cells, and they, they each illustrate different things, I think. One, one thing they illustrate is that uh, flows take place in cells across a wide variety of scales, from giant amoeboid cells that are crawling and that's, this is one of the very first kind of, uh, formal observations of flow inside of cells from 1857. It actually goes back another century before that, I think, at least. Uh, but this one is by Franz Schutze. And showing that as a cell, as an amoeboid cell crawls, it, it has these flow patterns that one observes that are presumably in the cytoplasm. And so this is an example of a, of a flow that's tied to a function. The, uh, the one in the middle is, is something I'll be talking about uh, today, which has to do with swirling flows, kind of rotational flows that appear uh, during development of fruit fly oocytes, where at a certain stage in the development of the oocyte, spontaneously you get these, these swirling flows uh, appear. And we have a, a theory for this, and this is uh, joint work with the Cambridge people, with, with Ray Goldstein and Eric Lauga and Gabriele Di Canio, and people within my own group at, at Flatiron. And so uh, I'll, talk about, I'll talk about that. And this seems to have a, 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 re, a function, which is probably transport of, of various types of uh, molecular signalers that need to get from one side of the cell to the other. So a third example also, which I'll say a little bit about as well, is uh, what, I'm, what I'm showing you here on the right in, in that middle kind of pink arrow uh, velocity field is cytoplasmic flows that are observed in uh, the route to the first cell division in C. elegans embryos. And these are gotten by uh, injecting or having parents ingest uh, nanodiamonds that get taken up in the eggs and then using those as passive, passive markers. And this is from Dan Needleman's group with Haiyan Wu at Harvard. And uh, what, what that velocity plot kind of hides from you is the fact that there's a massive machine or organelle that's sitting back there. And that's up above, that's the mitotic spindle. And what you're actually seeing is flow that's being created by the motion of the spindle itself. It's just being moved around by motors as you're moving towards cell division. And so in this case, the flow really is some sort of prognostic signal, which is perhaps telling you something about the way forces are transduced uh, within the embryo. So uh, all of these flows are associated with the cell's uh, cytoskeleton. So this is a, a set of biopolymers and motor proteins that move upon the uh, biopolymers and connect them to other objects, crosslinkers that crosslink the biopolymers. And these are the building blocks of, for example, the mitotic spindle. And they're also the objects that, that create immediate flow within cells. And so on the left, what you're seeing is a uh, kind of a multi-channel uh, fluorescence of various components inside of cells. Green is tubulin, which makes up microtubules. Uh, red is, is actin, and you can see it uh, isolated near the boundary or the periphery of the cell and the cortex. And then there's DNA, another type of polymer that's this thing in the nucleus. And so this is to give you an idea of, of how people uh, think about things moving around inside the cell, a very, a very classical uh, way of thinking about microtubules are as highways along which transport takes place. And so here, this is uh, a very well-known, uh, much admired, much loathed uh, <laughs> animation because it's very, very idealized. So people who are kind of down in the weeds on this, say things like, well, where's the thermal fluctuations, and these kinds of things. But, but it very ably illustrates how uh, motors carry payloads along these biopolymers. And you can imagine that if I had thousands of such motors carrying thousands of such payloads in any sort of coordinated way, it might create flows inside of these cells. So uh, what's, so in this, in this 
in this last, if I back up, the kinesin is, is dragging it through this, you know, what looks like water, this, this translucent medium. Uh, but what does the cytoplasm or kind of the fluid inside the cell really look like? Well, that, this is what comes out of uh, electron microscopy. This is the, quote, fluid of the cell, the cytoplasm. It's really a many component aqueous slurry full of all sorts of different kind of inclusions of different sizes, vesicles, uh, things that are carrying around gen uh, proteins and things like that. It's, it's a real mess. Uh, but there are some things that we can, we can say. Uh, it, it does behave like an inertial medium, if, or rather not inertial, but like a viscous medium if things are moving slowly enough, which they always are. And so that's the first thing to say is that inertial, uh, some fan, fun facts, inertial effects inside of cells, the flow mechanics of it are just absolutely unimportant. And so for those of you that have some background in fluid mechanics, we all know about the Reynolds number, which looks at the ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces for uh, some sort of deformable material. And if you estimate that for things going on inside of a cell, it's 10 to the minus eight on that order. Another aspect of these problems, which makes them challenging to, uh, to study is that the dynamics that goes on inside is very sensitive to the fact that it takes space with, place within a, within a confined space. The fact that the cell has these walls that pins everything down. So it's kind of very slow motion in a very small thing and the smallness makes a difference. Now, because this is a, a slurry and you have biopolymer, you have all this stuff in there, then elastic effects can be important. And so depending on the speed of motion of the thing you're thinking about, it could be that elastic effects are, are relevant. And that's typically characterized by something called the Weisenberg number. I'll be looking at cases where the Weisenberg number is, is very small, so we can, we'll just ignore it. And another aspect is that there are active forces that are driving uh, all of this dynamics inside the cell. It's, it's not like a weather system where the sun has some diurnal forcing of the earth and you, and you have this weather patterns that create, that get created. There are seasons you know, on the day, there are seasons on the year and the forcing is from outside. And that's not so here. You know, in many of these problems, the forcing is really from things that have to go on inside of the cell. So there are active forces from motor proteins moving on things, moving things around, things polymerizing. And so uh, another aspect of it is that forces inside the cell are often associated with what you would call a force dipole. Namely, something has to hold on to something to push on something else. So you, you have equal and opposite forces all over the place. It makes it kind of an interesting uh, mechanics problem. So there's, there's many levels at which you might think about uh, modeling these systems. And I'm going to talk uh, briefly about uh, two classes of continuum models. It's, it's often hard to do anything other than, than a continuum model because uh, it's very, very complex. So you'd like to simplify it by con considering it as a continuous medium. And so one version of that is, is to consider the cytoplasm as a confined Newtonian fluid, a very viscous fluid, and so governed by the incompressible Stokes equation. And we're going to think of that uh, Newtonian fluid as being filled with stuff. And so if you look at these, these two uh, pictures over here, these are from different kind of takes on things going on inside of a cell. Uh, this, is, this is from uh, work from Rosanna Zia at Stanford, thinking of the cell just filled with objects that are banging around because of thermal fluctuations in a fluid. While in the case at the right, this is some earlier work uh, within my own group where we're thinking about microtubules attached to payloads. And so you have this kind of geometrically very complex fluid mechanics problem you have to solve. And in these cases, you're really driven by boundary conditions on the immersed objects, or in the case of the top one, also uh, thermal fluctuations. And there's a whole set of methods that have been developed by applied mathematicians and numerical analysts and engineers, uh, including boundary integral methods, Stokesian dynamics, immersed boundary methods, and so on. So another type of model is similar, but, but it's one that really looks from a slightly uh, greater distance where you're thinking of it instead as a uh, coarse grain Stokes equation where we have some sort of forcing that we've derived through some sort of coarse graining method where all this stuff is, is giving you a force which is, which is driving the flow. And so this is really right here, F equals MA. And uh, so then I have a divergence-free Stokes equation again with some right-hand side, which is all the stuff pushing on the fluid. And then that stuff pushing on the fluid may have its own dynamics. And so on the right is a little schematic from uh, work of our own recently and thinking about uh, some of these Drosophila oocyte problems as 
basically beds of, of continuous microtubules that are all aligned with each other with motors moving on them, but we think of it as kind of a multi-component material and we derive equations that reflect that. So uh, let me tell you about my, my favorite uh, cytoskeletal actors. And what I'm really gonna be talking about are microtubules, which are long uh, um, on the scale of these things, uh, five to say 30 microns, it's long to us. Uh, long, rather rigid microtubules, or rather rigid uh, biopolymers. They're, they're very thin, uh, about 25 nanometers in diameter, but their persistence length to thermal fluctuations is well beyond the cell size. So they're, they're quite rigid re relative to thermal fluctuations. Typically, they're also very uh, dynamic, as many of the elements of the cytoskeleton are. Things are constantly assembling and disassembling, which is kind of a very interesting feature of this. Like its uh, other uh, biopolymer brethren, uh, actin, it's also polar, and there are motors that know which way to move on it. There's a plus end and a minus end, and they're also, they're also flexible. So the thing about microtubules is that given their rigidity, uh, they are objects through which a lot of force is transduced, say, from a motor onto a, onto a payload. So it might be a nuclear complex carrying genetic material, for example. And so uh, let me just say for microtubules, here's kind of three ways in which you can actively transduce force because imagine I have a microtubule that's, that's attached to some sort of object in the cell and you and you want to move a force, you want to create a force and move that object around. So here's three very typical ones from the interaction of microtubules with motors and payloads and also with surfaces. One, as I told you, microtubules are constantly assembling and disassembling. And while they're assembling, they can actually, as they grow, they grow from their plus end, which say here I've abutted next to a boundary. And so as it grows, it creates a pushing force. So it can push against the boundary and in and, and that way move a payload, this kind of green sphere down here. Another way uh, things can be moved is that motors, molecular motors, uh, can be attached to the boundary of the cell. And if a, if a microtubule comes near them, the motor can attach and being jointly attached to both the microtubule and to the boundary will pull the object towards it, the payload towards it, because it's trying to walk towards, say, the payload. And that's what a dynein actually would do, a so-called dynein motor. There's also other types of pulling forces, and this is part of the story today, which, which has to do with motors carrying payloads. And so if I have a motor carrying a payload, like in that movie that I showed you, to move that payload, it has to push the payload through, the, through a fluid, so there's a force on the fluid, and there must be an equal and opposite force that the motor exerts on the, on the, on the substrate upon which it's moving, which is, which is the microtubule. That's really the first example I, I've really given of what you would call a force dipole. There's equal and opposite forces in this and the way things move around. And you can have motors use the, their objects they're carrying as kind of anchors in the cytoplasm to pull payloads on microtubules around. Okay, so let me give you an example. And this is a very classical one. It's a, it's a beautiful one. And this is showing uh, in the C. elegans embryo how arrays of microtubules, which are those, those green arrays that you see between these two red blobs in this movie, uh, will transport those two red blobs, which are the male and female pronucleus, into the center of the cell so that a mitotic spindle can form. And that's the object that orchestrates the division of chromosomes. And you can divide the nuclear material and move into the very first cell division. So uh, there it doesn't go. Let me do that again. Back up. Yeah, there's a delay here, unfortunately. So there we go. We get this rotation of this object, the formation of a mitotic spindle, the condensation of the chromosomes, and then things get pulled apart. So uh, when I talked about having classes of models, which were the Stokes equations with immersed objects, this is a, an example of such a simulation. And this is from uh, work a few years ago, uh, led by Asan Nazitas, who at the time was in my group. And this is showing the instantiation of this transport mechanism where we're assuming that microtubules are attaching to motors on the boundary and they're causing the object to which the microtubules are attached to get moved. Now for the cell, it's very important that this object, these two pronuclei, get into the center of the cell and that it rotates so that the mitotic spindles lined up with the long axis. 
And that is so that you can go into the first cell division in what's called proper position. And this model does that perfectly well, we show through these simulations. And this captures fluid mechanics and elasticity of microtubules and their interaction hydrodynamically with both immersed objects and with the boundary. But we can also use it to, to investigate other types of models. For example, when motors are carrying payloads, they will also, that are attached to microtubules, they will also cause this centering and rotation. And what, what we're showing here is simulating two different uh, models of such force transduction, run from pulling of motors from the boundary and the other uh, pulling of payloads through the cytoplasm. And you can see that at a certain stage, which I won't really go into because I don't have the time, which is called oscillation, we can use our simulations to assess what types of flow fields these different methods, these different methods of force transduction give. And you can see they're very different, even though they accomplished the same, the same thing. And what we were able to do was to, was to team up with Dan Needleman's group and Haiyan Wu in, in particular, who was able to assist us in, in actually measuring these flows using nano diamonds, as I intimated. And this is showing that this case of cortical pulling gives an extremely good match down to fine scale details of kind of smaller scale vertical flows with what you actually see experimentally. So that's, that's one class of, of kind of flow problems. And what you're doing is you're using the numerical method to produce flow fields under different assumptions on how forces get transduced and then understand how forces are transduced in the real, in the real cell. So that's one use of fluid mechanics, a very non-trivial one. Okay, but let me tell you about uh, something, I guess I have 12 minutes, that's good. Let me, let me tell you about uh, a different problem and this is flows in, in Drosophila oogenesis. And I won't go, I don't have the time to go into a lot of this, uh, except to say that there's a whole machinery which creates a set of 16 cells. And out of this 16 cells, these are all kind of proto eggs, if you like, uh, one is selected to become the oocyte, kind of the, the pre-embryo. And the rest of the cells called the nurse cell, so this is in, in, inside of a uh, fruit fly. Now, uh, the rest of the cells collaborate in providing their contents and nutrition, their metabolic products to this oocyte, which will then become an egg. And as I said, uh, there is this period during the development where as the oocyte is developing and growing and these nurse cells are dumping uh, stuff into it, suddenly you develop a swirling flow inside of this rather large egg, which is now about 200 microns. Now, that's very interesting because there are things that have to happen, and maybe this has to do with it. You have to be able to move products from the so-called anterior side where the nurse cells are to the posterior side so that the uh, body plan can be set up appropriately. That's one thing. And you perhaps also want to mix things together uh, in the cell, and, and flows might be good at doing that. So uh, we decided to take a look at this problem and see if we could, we're not the first, but I think we have this very beautiful model for it, uh, and see if we could understand how these flows come to rise. And what we found was a new uh, kind of flow instability for an active porous medium. And I'll tell you about this briefly. But let me just say why the flow. And, and uh, I think the reason why the flow is, is that flows get things around much, uh, much quicker, uh, as this particular example illustrates, if I wanted to diffuse the protein from the anterior to the posterior through this cytoplasm, that would take about a day. But it takes about 20 minutes to move it physically from, from one side to the other. And, and so these are, this is a flow that you would call large Peclay number. It's, it's dominated by transport rather than by diffusion of objects. So how do these flows develop? Well, uh, it turns out that they're powered by kinesin motors that are carrying payloads moving along the microtubule. And these microtubules are bound to the side of the cell and they're very long lived, about 20 minutes, so atypical. And these motors are carrying things to the plus end of the, of the microtubule. And uh, what, that, what might that do? If you knock down these kinesin motors, these, these flows stop. So you have this kind of whisker, you know, beard short beard of microtubules that are lining the, the inside of the cell. I, I forgot to tell you that. So here's our conceptual model, simply that motors are moving along microtubules and because they're dragging their payload, they're exerting a force on the fluid and there's gotta be an equal and opposite force on the microtubule. 
And maybe what's happening is that if you get enough motors, your payloads are big enough, you can cause these microtubules to collectively do something. In this case, it's going to be to buckle and what might be the consequences of that. Now, the way we, the way we studied this is through a coarse grain model that, that I and David uh, Stein developed for uh, other reasons. Uh, we had a paper on this last year, which describes the dynamics of a porous medium, which is a Stokes fluid, which is penetrated by aligned elastic fibers. And what we did is we adapted this to Drosophila oocytes, thinking of these elastic fibers as being the microtubules that are coating the inside of the Drosophila. And then we put a model for motors moving on them. And so uh, here's that four Stokes equation at the bottom that I was telling you about. And what is forced by are the bending forces and tensile forces of these microtubules as they are being forced by motor forces. I won't say why there's a motor force here and there isn't one here that has to do with things being dipoles, but there's a motor force that we are using as a model that's directed along the, the uh, axis of these microtubules and is creating a compressive stress. And so what we showed was that this model will produce a variety of very interesting behaviors. So a, if you have a kind of a rather sparse collection of microtubules, these motors will cause it to go into oscillation. But it turns out that once you get enough microtubules packed in there, it gets dense enough, then there's a state that becomes accessible. Well, all the microtubules, when they buckle, they fold over such like that. And what does that do? This is a collective thing. I'm just showing one out of the many, but what happens when it folds over? Well, what it does is this. Here we've put a bunch of them inside of a, a circular confinement on the right. They fold over, they drive a flow that in this case is moving uh, counterclockwise, and you end up with a persistent, now this is time dependent, you end up with a persistent rotational flow that's being driven by motors that are moving on kind of the top canopy of all these bent over microtubules. And uh, this is the stability diagram uh, that's associated with these types of, of flows of straight microtubules under, under a compressive load from motors. And what it's showing you is that there's a big region as a function of microtubule density and strength of the motor where you have this swirling instability and you only access it by having dense enough microtubules. So how does it compare with experiments? So uh, these are PID uh, illustrations that, that we've done in our, in our own group uh, with uh, Stas uh, Schwarzman and uh, Siantan Dutta at Princeton, our collaborators. And what this is showing is that solid body rotation. And this is showing the flow that you get from this instability, the so-called swirling instability. And we have a geometric picture of it where everything has folded over like that, that moves into that steady state. You get this buckling, folding over and motors are moving along that top surface and driving this flow around and around. And so those motors on this top canopy look like a delta function of force arranged azimuthally. And so they have a, they're displaced away from the boundary. So you have this kind of linear shear that's driven by activity and then it drives a solid body rotation on the inside. And we can, we can map this quant, qual, quantitatively with the experiments. We can find regions of uh, physically reasonable velocities, which are 100 to 400 nanometers per second. And what we can show is that a single motor force of five piconewtons, you could have one to six kinesium motors per microtubule to make that happen, which seems quite reasonable. Okay, so uh, I'm running out of time here. So let me just say that the full 3D structure of these flows is, is not yet known. Uh, Rotational flow by itself would not seem to promote rapid mixing. So perhaps there are other elements of that flow that are related to the geometry of the cell. It's not known so, how the flow pattern. Yes. So, so sorry, Mike, about one minute left. Oh, yeah, that's what I figured. I'm heading to my last slide. Perfect. Yep. And so uh, so do these, is there a, a, a rapid mixing part of this? Other flow components we haven't seen? Uh, what drives the transition? Uh, is it changes in size, changes in viscosity, number of motor, motor proteins? More, more theory and experiments are needed to do that. But let me just close with a, a fully 3D simulation of 3,000 microtubules. And this is by one of our postdocs, Gokberg, uh, whose last name I can never pronounce. Sorry, Gokberg. Uh, where I have 3,000 microtubules inside, coating the inside of a sphere 
and they will self-organize and spontaneously choose a direction around which the motor proteins moving on them will drive a swirling flow. Okay, so uh, I will stop there and take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike, for an interesting talk. We have um, we have several questions. Um, so, so there were a couple that dealt with the C. elegans um, spindle oscillation related flows that you showed earlier in the talk. So first, um, Sri Ram Ramaswamy asked if if that cell is done if that study is done with a cell sitting on a substrate, um, and um, if the flow has a preferred sense of circulation relative to the geometry outside. So the answer is yes and yes. Okay. So, so, they, <laughs> those so they are a, little, are a little bit squashed, and you tend to find the oscillation moving in, in, in kind of you know in the long direction. It's a slight squashing. I, I, maybe it's fifteen percent or something like that, but that's enough to to make it move in kind of in a plane. Good good questions. Uh, but and, and the circulation the circulation is one way always or? Oh it no it's not. Okay. And since it's an there's, no, there's nothing chiral in there. Yeah, it will change direction as it moves back up. Okay. Um, and also about the C. elegans system, Eric Dufresne asked if, um, it, is it true that, that the flow is so simple that could that make it hard to pin down the model? Um, and then a couple of related questions about, um, is the flow field time averaged? Um, and what about fluctu fluctuations in the model and the experiment? Okay. So, so uh, on, on the first question, now, remind me of Eric's first question. I'm sorry. So, so with such a simple flow field, oh, does, yeah. that, does that no, does that does that does that constrain cytoplasmic pulling versus other mechanisms? Is that roughly not, right, not, Eric? Not entirely. And okay. so, what I what I did not mention is that there's a whole other class of experiments that Dan's group did involving laser ablation, and uh, what that what they showed was that other type is that it's definitely pulling. It's not pushing against the boundary, and by selectively ablating, you can also show it's not pulling. Uh, cytoplasmically, it's truly really coming from the boundary. Okay. So, so there's, there's a lot there. more that constrains constrains that than I said. Uh, so yes, uh, those are not actually time averaged. They are averaged over embryos. I think so. I think in that uh, flow field that came from the experiments, the n is about 28, if I recall. So that was very arduous work to actually to pull out an average flow field out of that. Okay. Um, and then Eric had also asked about um, fluctuations um, relative to the average flow and comparing those between the model. Yeah, and the uh, I'd like to show a movie if I have time. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Let's see if I can um, grab back with control. This will just answer this very directly. I'm gonna have to, someone might wanna ask another question while I open up another file. Okay, um, so, so Ashok Prasad also had a question related to the C. elegans flows. Um, he was asking, is the flow simply driven by the rotation of the spindle or is there some non-trivial interaction? So for example, does the flow also facilitate the rotation? That's, you, you, you know, so the, uh, the other case I was talking about, which is a cytoplasmic pulling model, that's a beautiful model put forward by Kimura and Kimura and that we investigated in earlier uh, numerical work. Uh, but it just doesn't, and, and that's where the flow actually kind of organizes the way everything happens. And so here in this case, it seems to all be coming from force, kind of forces being exerted from the boundary. And so it, it's, it's really just the flow is coming from the way those forces are pushing things around in the interior. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Let me see if, oh, there it is. Okay, let me show this. Just to give an idea of what the fluctuations look like. So, so right now we're still seeing your slide. Oh, oh okay, okay, here we go. Now I see it. Yeah, there it is. So, so that's actually a picture. There it goes, okay, now, now it's going into oscillations. You can see a nice signal out of that, but you can see there's a fair amount of fluctuation still going on. And so you have to do a fair amount of averaging. Okay. Those are, those are passivated nanodiamonds right. that are being passed. Okay. 